Greetings, Presbyterian Church of Dover, members, friends, those who are watching today. This is a virtual worship service. We are no longer at this time doing in-person worship um, due to the pandemic. The uh, session will be meeting this week to discuss when we might be coming back in person. If I had to venture a guess, I would say it will. It, we won't be starting next week. It will probably be sometime after the new year. But we'll keep you posted on that, uh, either with our email or both with our email blast and also on YouTube. As far as Christmas Eve goes, if we are meeting in person, and again, I think this will be unlikely, we'll have a family-oriented worship service that will be online, and that will include telling a story for the, for the kids. And, uh, and then we would meet in person for the 9 o'clock uh, traditional uh, communion candlelight service. And uh, that one will not be put online if, if uh, we're doing it in person. If we're not doing in-person worship, then there'll only be one service online, and it'll be a combination of the two, and um, both the family tradition and the uh, uh, communion candlelight service. Either way, we hope to have a, a wonderful Christmas Eve service planned planned out for for you to participate in. We are, we're trying to be careful with this. So be, be patient with us. We, we want to do the right thing and uh, make sure that we are protecting people and we are not a place where the virus is spread. Having said that, glad you are with us today. And as I'd like to begin each worship service, let me say, whoever you are and wherever you are on your faith's journey, you are welcome here. And we pray that the transforming love of Jesus might touch your life today. So let us enter into our worship. Please join me for the call to worship. We'll also be lighting the Advent wreath. The Advent wreath is a circle with no beginning and no end. It is a symbol of God's unending love and faithfulness. We light the Advent candles as a sign of our waiting and for hope of the coming Christ. Week one, we lit the candle of hope the hope of our coming Savior, Jesus. Last week, we lit the candle of peace, the peace that Jesus, our Savior, gives to the world. Today, we light the candle of joy, the joy we have in Jesus, our Savior. God of grace, timeless grace, you fill us with joyful expectation. Make us ready for the message that prepares the way that with uprightness of heart and holy joy, we may eagerly await the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen.
the call to confession. The Bible teaches that we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. It also teaches that in Jesus Christ we find grace and forgiveness of our sins. Therefore, let us confess our sins. Please join me for the prayer of confession. God of the future, you are coming in power to bring all nations under your rule. We confess that we have not expected your kingdom, for we live casual lives, ignoring your promised judgment. We accept lies as truth, exploit neighbors, abuse the earth, and refuse your justice and peace. In your mercy, forgive us. Grant us wisdom to welcome your way and to seek things that will endure when Christ comes to judge the world. And the people said, Amen. The wilderness will rejoice, the dry land will blossom, the people of God will return with joy and singing. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please join me for the prayer of illumination. Holy God, our hope and strength, by the power of your Spirit, prepare the way of our hearts of the coming of your word, so that we may see the glorious signs of your promise fulfilled through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading comes to us from Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 to 4 and 8 to 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offsprings among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mary, did you know that your baby
comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 16 to 24. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be sound and blameless in the coming of our Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And it reads this way. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your wound and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. During this Advent season, we're looking at the phrase, do not be afraid. We find this phrase throughout the Bible. Uh, whenever God seems to be doing something special, something new, it, all, it almost always has to start with, do not be afraid. And we see this especially in these birth narratives of Jesus. Last week, we saw the priest, Zechariah, uh, had an angel visit him and told him not to be afraid. And then he received the good news that his wife Elizabeth, who had been barren, was to have a child, even in their old age. But it began with do not be afraid. Today we look at Mary, uh, hearing the same words. Next week we'll look at Joseph, where he hears these words in a dream as he contemplates what he should be doing with Mary, whether he should marry her or not. And then next, uh, and then after that is the shepherds in the field when the angel appeared and they were afraid. The angel said, do not fear, for the angel came with good news. And usually when the angel comes like this, it is good news. But when God is getting ready to do something special, something new, 
Often, our first instinct is to be afraid. We don't like change. We don't really like things that are new. And so we need to be told, do not be afraid. It's all right. Things are going to be okay. So let's look at Mary. When she heard these words from the angel Gabriel, she was probably about 13 years of age. This was the age that girls in that time would become engaged. And uh, she likely was uneducated, at least in the ways that we are, with reading and writing. Her life would have centered around her family, which we know nothing about, and also around the synagogue, which was the religious hub of the community, and then with the people of Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was a very small village, maybe 70 to 100 people, perhaps even smaller than that. It was a place where everybody knew everybody, and everybody knew everybody's name, or business, rather, their name also. Everybody knew everybody's business. And we know that Mary was engaged to Joseph. Now, an engagement was arranged by the parents, and it was legally binding. To break off an engagement was, would be the same as having a divorce, not something that you would want to do or look forward to doing. But the engagement generally lasted for a year, and during that time, the bride and the groom continued to live with their, each their own parents, until the day of the wedding. And the wedding would be just a festive celebration that the whole village would be at. It would be an exciting time for the bride and the groom, perhaps even the highlight of their life. And the, <clears throat> the wedding festivities would last for, for a week or more. And once it was over, the bride and groom, the new couple, would, uh, would move into a new room uh, that the parents, the groom's parents, had added on to the home. And then they would expect to start producing babies. So if Mary were to become pregnant before the wedding, everybody would know. And it would be the talk of the village. And it would produce quite a scandal. And um, especially in a place like Nazareth, where everybody did know everybody else and everybody did know everyone else's business. And it would be made even worse if Joseph were to say he was not the father. It might be expected that the, 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 the fiancé would, the groom, future groom might be the father, but if he said he was not, then that would mean to the people that Mary had committed adultery, and that could even be punished by death. Um, so it could be serious things that were happening here in this story. So when the angel appeared to Mary, we're not told that he appeared like we often think of angels, all dressed in white with wings and the halo and all of that, but rather, more than likely, he appeared as a normal person, a normal human being. It was not his appearance that frightened Mary, but it was his message. And he called her favored one, and that the Lord was with her, and she did not understand what this meant, and it caused fear in her, and, and the angel goes on to tell her to not be afraid. And he tells her that his message, uh, uh, he goes on with this message that she would be the mother of the long-awaited Messiah, the one that the Jews had been waiting centuries for. And she was to be this one's mother. How exciting would that be? For she, as everyone else, would have longed for that Messiah to come, but to be the one that would give birth to the Messiah. Wow, that had to be uh, just uh, overwhelming for Mary. Uh, but Mary started to wonder, well, how would this happen? She was not yet married. She was still a virgin. At my previous church, we had a preschool. And each week I would go and I would tell a Bible story to the preschool kids. And about this time each year, I would tell them the story of 
Mary and Gabriel and being told that she would be the mother of the Messiah. But you get to this talk about the virgin birth and not being married and, and you don't want to, uh, you want the kids to have some idea of what you're saying and not confuse them too much. And finally I arrived at the, I would tell them, to them this way, that Mary would say to the angel, I have not done what people have to do in order to have a baby. And fortunately the kids were good with that. They didn't, they didn't question me what I meant by that. But that's basically what's going on here. Uh, Mary saying, I am a virgin. Uh, how is this to be? And, and the, uh, the angel responds, it will be the Holy Spirit. Now, this is not a biological explanation. This is a theological explanation. From the very beginning of the church, they, they held that Jesus was both human and divine. God in the flesh. And this passage that we have here is one of the ways that it is explained. And Mary is called a virgin in both Matthew's account and in uh, Luke's account. Now I know it's hard for some people to to even to believe that the, that that uh, you could have a virgin uh, uh, birth. But my answer to that would be: We worship the God who created all things. Create all things out of nothing. Is it too bit much of a stretch of the imagination to believe that the God who created the universe could miraculously impregnate Mary? Today, human beings are able to clone animals. Is it that much of a stretch that God couldn't impregnate a virgin? How different is that? I think Mary had every right to be afraid, even more so after the angel's message. She was opening herself up for scandal. Um, the possible ending of her engagement, the, the, the possibility of her dream wedding, the, um, the certain humiliation that would be put upon her and her family possibly even facing death. And yet her response was, here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. Did she take time to think through all these consequences before she said yes? Did perhaps 10 minutes after Gabriel left, she go, oh my, what have I done? This is crazy. How am I gonna tell my parents? How am I going to tell Joseph? Would you like to have the answer to those questions? Unfortunately, we don't. What we do see in Mary is a very proactive faith. A proactive faith does not live in the paralysis of doubt and disillusionment. Instead, one with a proactive faith actively pursues God's redemptive purposes and recognizes God's presence in the midst of any circumstance, any situation, even when it doesn't make sense. God's Holy Spirit is with us when things are messy and when things just don't, we just can't comprehend it all. This Advent season brings to us an invitation as surely as Gabriel brought an invitation to Mary. And part of that invitation is for us to offer ourselves wholly to God, just as Mary did. Christmas is not how much you buy or what you eat or whom you visit, especially this Christmas during the pandemic. Instead, it's your willingness to say with Mary, here I am, Lord, use me according to your word. And this means that we need to be listening for these messengers of God that come to us. And so when we listen to God's messengers, let us also consider that moment of decision for Mary. We see in her a witness and example of how we are meant to live. Her mission reminds us that God's call is sometimes difficult. 
And it may lead us to set aside uh, our own plans. It may mean giving up hopes and dreams that we have cherished for a lifetime. It may mean taking risks, and those risks might be frightening. And sometimes God asks us to be with people we don't want to be with, to do things we don't want to do, to go places we don't want to go. And this is part of Mary's story. Twice in our reading, Mary is said to be favored by God. And yet God's favor does not necessarily mean a life of bliss. Often it means a life of risk. It must have been hard to imagine that this life was uh, what it meant to be favored by God. But in this life, Mary found joy. <clears throat> joy, unlike happiness, can come to us independent of our circumstances. It comes not from changing our circumstances, but rather from viewing them with eyes of faith. Joy is a choice we make when we look at our present circumstances through the eyes of faith, trusting that God is at work and that he will never leave us or abandon us. <coughs> As we think about God's calling for our lives, there is much out there that might frighten us. But let us hear God's reassuring words. Do not be afraid. Let us remember that God is with us at all times and that God is in control at all times. Amen. Let us move now to the uh, prayers of the people. And we begin with our breath prayer that helps us to, to slow down and focus and get ready to pray. And for this breath prayer today, our inhale will be, I will not be afraid. Our exhale will be, God is in control. I will not be afraid. God is in control. So let us pray. Gracious God, you have called us to follow you. Sometimes this is not easy for us. There are times that we are afraid, afraid of what you might ask us to do, afraid that we might not be up to the challenge, afraid of what others might think. So help us to not be afraid. May we walk by faith in your love and grace. And we pray, especially during this pandemic, that we'll not be afraid. But we, may we use every precaution so as to not become infected with the virus. And we pray for that time when we can return to in-person worship. And even further down the road when our worship service returns to that place where we don't need to wear masks or social distance. But we can sing out loud and we can hug one another. May that day come soon. Meanwhile, we pray for our church member who currently has the virus and also for her husband who is in critical condition from the virus. Bring your healing touch to them and also to others that are sick from the virus. We pray for an end to this pandemic. May the vaccines be effective in stopping the spread of the virus and may they be distributed quickly and efficiently. We recognize that this Christmas will be very different for many of us. Still, we ask that it might be a meaning, that it might be meaningful to us as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. May we remember that this is the true reason we celebrate Christmas. We lift up our prayer list to you and ask that you be with those on the list and answer our prayers for them. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, and we offer up the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen.